Hello everybody, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible series is going to be on war in heaven, war on earth. And I have every intention of finishing the Hosea series. But, uh, you know, the reason I'm going to do this is because people wonder why God commanded the Canaanites to be exterminated. And I've actually had people say that God's a homicidal maniac. You know, after all, he told Israel, go in and kill them all. And uh, they say, well, I don't, I don't want to worship a God like that. So why did God command the extermination of the Canaanites? Well, I did a series, a playlist on YouTube on the angels that sinned. War in heaven, war on earth. So let's open up with Genesis chapter 1. I guess we'll start in verse 26. And God said, let us, plural, let us make man in our image. Now, why would he say that? Is there more than one God? I mean, the Bible declares that there's only one God. Why would he say, let us? Is he talking to the angels? No. No. You see, people will say, oh, well, Trinity, that's a false doctrine. That word doesn't belong in the Bible. Well, that's true. But the word Godhead does. And the Bible clearly records that man has a body, man has a soul, and man has a spirit. And your body is not your soul, and your soul is not your spirit, and your spirit is not your body. So three parts make up a man or a woman. So you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why, and God said, let us make man in our image. If you read John chapter 1, you will know that the Son created everything. Jesus was the creator of heaven and earth. That's why you can say, let, why God can say, let us make man in our image. But that's another study altogether. So let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now, I believe right here, uh, when it says male and female created he them, I believe, now this is my opinion, and if you disagree, that's fine, because, uh, you know, I, I'm not the end of all Bob, Bible knowledge, that's for sure. But right here, I believe that this is where God created the souls of every male and female that would ever live. If that's what I believe, because Adam's body hadn't been formed yet. But uh, now you got to realize, God's ruling in heaven, so he created man to be in his image to rule over on the earth. Think about that. We'll get back. To, we'll get. We'll, we'll get back to that. So. Male and female created he them, verse 28. And God blessed them, 
And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion. Dominion. You know what the root word for dominion is? Dominate. God wanted his people to have dominion, to dominate the earth, to be the rulers, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl, fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. Now, back in the old days, meat just meant to have, to eat. I mean, if you look at the word meat, take out the M and you got E-A-T. Of course, meat today now means steak and some people it means pork or chicken or fish. But back in the old days, I am i bet you they were vegetarians back in the old days. I'm not sure. Verse 30. And to every beast of the, feet of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth and wherein this, there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw e and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. All right, so up to this point, God looked at everything he had made, and everything was good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, I don't believe that Satan had fallen yet. That's my opinion. I think up to this point, everything was good. Chapter 2, Genesis 2, 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Now, there's a, when they talk about the host of heaven, they're talking about angels. Verse 2. So I think um, there's a verse in Job 38 where it says that the sons of God and the stars shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth. Now, when you go through all six days and the seventh day, there's no record of when the Lord created the angels. So my opinion is, if you use logic, the, if the angels shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth, the angels had to have been in creation before the earth was formed. So, you know, you look at Genesis 1 through 6. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, the first day, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day, seventh day. There's no record of when the Lord created the angels. The angels exist, so they had to exist prior to the earth. Just my opinion. Uh, I know sometimes I'm long-winded and do a lot of uh, foundational and background work, but sometimes you have to. And I have to assume that, you know, some of the people that listen to my studies, I mean, some of them are quite well advanced in, in Bible knowledge. I'm sure some of them exceed my knowledge and maybe a lot of areas, maybe all of them, who knows. But I have to assume that somebody's starting with very little knowledge. So that's that's why, you know, that's why sometimes I go to a lot of trouble with the foundational stuff. All right, so, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, 
God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. It said he rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, I believe some people will tell you that Adam, man, was an eighth-day creation. Uh, there's some evidence to that, but I, I think he was a six-day creation. But uh, And I don't think God created anything after the seventh day. That's just my opinion. If you disagree, that's fine. Um, you know, but God rested not because he was tired, but he did it. You know, like Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. You know, the seventh day was a day for us to rest our bodies and to reflect upon the things of the Lord. So, that's just it. Now, the word Adam and man are synonymous. And Revelation 13 and 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and 6. 666. Six, six. Adam was created on the sixth day. That's what I believe. Uh, I know there's people in the identity movement who will tell you that the non-white races were created on the sixth day and then Adam was created on the eighth day. Yeah. Personally, I think the non-Adamic people were created on the fifth day. But that's all right. If you disagree, that's okay. I mean, it's, I, it's, I'm just saying. All right, now, I don't want to read the entire first chapter of Genesis. If you want to read it by yourself and find out that the angels are not mentioned in the creation, well, that's up to you. But uh, turn to Job chapter 38, and we will prove that the angels existed before the earth did, and that they are called the sons of God. After all, if God created them, who's their father? Job 38, verse 1. Now, Job had been tested of Satan. We're going to probably uh, do a little bit on that on Job chapter 1. And... In many ways, he was, he was a righteous man, but some of the things that he was saying about all the bad things that happened to him didn't please the Lord. So, you know, he had a lot of good things in his favor, but there were some things that the Lord was not pleased with. So, how did the Lord answer Job? Well, let's read on. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Job 38, verse 2, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Now, if you don't have uh, light, well, then you've got darkness, because darkness is the absence of light. And he's saying, basically he's saying here, uh, you're talking about things that you don't know anything about. That's basically what the Lord's telling Job here. Words without knowledge. Verse 3. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. In other words, put on your pants like a man, and I'm going to talk. To, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to give me an answer. All right, let's take a look. Job 38 and verse 4. God asked Job the following. Where wast thou 
when I laid the foundations of the earth. In other words, where were you when I made the earth? He says, declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Now, if anybody's been in construction or carpentry, uh, you'll know that uh, you stretch out a line when you want to build something along a straight, no, a straight line, right? And, you know, you have measure uh, measures. So, you know, these are construction type terms. And God's asking him, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I created the earth. Where were you? Verse 6, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? You know, uh, when you build a house, it's you got to have a foundation. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Well, guess what, people? Christ is the cornerstone. Christ was, is, and always shall be the cornerstone. But that's a whole study in it of itself. All right, so the Lord's talking to Job here about the foundation of the earth, the creation of the earth. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together. The morning stars sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, Adam is called in Matthew 1, when you trace back Christ's lineage, uh, Adam is called a son of God. After all, who made him? Who created him? Who was his father? Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. Begotten has reference to of the same essence. Adam was not of the same essence as Christ. Believers do not become sons of God until they're born again of the Holy Spirit. So who are these sons of God? Well, they existed and they shouted for joy at the creation of the earth. Adam did not even have a body to shout with until after the earth was created. When somebody asks you what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, what came first? The Adam or the earth? Well, the earth had to come first because God took of the earth and formed man's body and then breathed into him the breath of life. So the earth came first. So who are these morning stars that sang together and all the sons of God shouting for joy at the creation of the earth. They have to be angels. There's just no other way around it, if you use logic. Now, let's take a look. Let's take a look at something here. What are these stars, the morning stars, you know, and the sons of God? Well, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, And he, Jesus, and he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now, you want to know the interpretation? Go to Revelation 1 verse 20. So let's go from 16 to 20. The mystery of the seven stars, stars, and we're not talking about Hollywood here. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So here it is, we're talking about stars. And the Lord says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. 
and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Ah. So people, it's a figure of speech. Okay, when, you know, a lot of people use figures, of, there's a lot of figures of speech in the Bible. And if you use the Bible to interpret the Bible, and that only really works with the King James, that I, to, to the best of my knowledge, the modern versions change the words so that you don't make the word connection. So we're going to go back to Revelation 12 later where uh, the dragon's tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So we're talking about, you know, there was a war in heaven, right? War in heaven? War on earth. So, so the stars, if you use the Bible, interpret the Bible, they are angels. And the sons of God are also mentioned, right? So, verse 7, Job 38. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy at the foundation or the creation of the earth. There you go. Now, why are they called morning stars? Well, just remember something in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And if you want to see that, turn on the 700 Club or the or TBN. Verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Wherefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end is shall be according to their works. So there you have it, people. Uh, the stars, now sometimes when they talk about stars, they're talking about, you know, suns up in the sky, you know, stars in the heavens, the moon, you know, but sometimes when they're talking about stars, they're talking about, uh, no, we're not talking about Hollywood. No, we're talking about angels. And angels of light, maybe that's why they're called morning stars. So we're going to get more into that. So, all right, let's take a look at Job chapter 1. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed Evil means he hated and avoided evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance, his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camel and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Now, let me tell you something. If you've got 7,000 sheep, uh, you're going to need more than seven sons to keep an eye on them. So, evidently, he had servants. He had to have had servants. I mean, so uh, this guy was pretty wealthy. Verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day. Now, some Bible scholars say that this is a birth, his, their birthday every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, Bible scholars will point out that 
Oh, well, Job was only worried about his sons. He didn't care about his daughters. He didn't offer burnt offerings for his daughters. That's because he didn't care for his daughters. Well, you know what? Maybe his daughters were far more godly than his sons. Did you ever think about that? I, that's that's kind of how I see it. Maybe his daughters were far more righteous in their works than the sons. Maybe that's why Job uh, did burnt offerings for the sons. It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. I bet you his daughters were a lot more righteous than his sons. That's... I don't know. We'll find out one day if you're in Christ. Verse 6. Now listen carefully. We already established in Job 38 that the morning stars and the sons of God shouted for joy at the foundation or the creation of the earth. Okay? They existed before the earth existed. When you read Genesis 1, it doesn't say when the angels were created. Adam didn't come until after the earth was created. So the sons of God have to be angels, period. There's no other way around it. Listen to this. Verse 6, Job 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Uh, in other words, where are you, where, where, where are you coming from? Where, where have you been? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Oh yeah, man, I'm just kind of walking around, you know, hanging out, checking things out. That's what Satan does, right? And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth, God, doth Job fear God for naught? Uh, you know, uh, does Job fear you for nothing? Verse 10, Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? In other words, there's a hedge of protection. I did a Bible study called The Hedge, where I proved this from the Bible. You know, when it says he puts a hedge around him, uh, it's a fence, people. You know, and what, what do fences do? Uh, they protect people from the outside world. You know, so <laughs> God put a hedge around Job that Satan couldn't get in there, right? Hast thou not made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Oh yeah, you protect him, you've blessed him, everything he touches increases. And, and you know, but here's the punchline, verse 11. But put forth, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. In other words, take everything away from him, and he's, he's going to, Job will curse you to your face, God. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, oh yeah? Uh, oh yeah, you want to make a bet with me, Satan? Uh, that's the Bob translation. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. In other words, you could take, you could touch anything you want, but you can't kill him. You can do everything else. Now that's basically, that's how I see it. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Verse 13, And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. 
And the Sabaeans, uh, I believe the Sabaeans were uh, an early name for the Arabs, I'm not sure. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, is this the fire of God or fire from heaven? Well, guess what, people? Uh, this servant mistaken the fire of Satan for the fire of God. That's my opinion. If you disagree, that's okay, but this is Satan doing this. All right, so does pa Satan have power to bring fire down from the sky, or only God? Well, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 13 real quick, and then we're going to go back to Job chapter 1. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So this beast looks like a lamb, but he speaks as a dragon. And the Bible tells you the dragon is the devil, people. So, this beast, verse 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was heal. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Ah, the beast. He makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. See, Satan has power, people. But you got to realize, he's like a big dog on a short leash. He can only do what God allows him to do. Verse 14. So he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Bingo! So, Job 1, verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consume them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Who are the Chaldeans? Uh, uh, let's see. Well, they were part of Babylon. Uh, and some say they were the rulers of Babylon. So, you know, the Chaldeans made off with his camels, right? All right, so let's go to verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came another also and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. A great wind from the wilderness. What is this, a tornado? And smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So, Satan has uh, power to control the weather, a great wind, and fire from heaven. Let's take a look at something real quick. Well, let's take a look at the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, evening, he, Jesus, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took 
him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. I wonder who sent this. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he, Jesus, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? You know, the ship's full of water, and, you know, it's the waves are beating the ship, and there's wind, and, you know, I wonder who's sending this, right? Carest thou not that we perish? And he, Jesus, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Jesus speaking, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Oh yeah, people. All right, back to Job chapter 1 and verse 19. So Satan has power to bring fire down from the sky, if God allows it, and the power of wind probably a tornado. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I am escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 20, Job 1 verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Boy, that's a testimony, huh? All right, let's read Job chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Ah, you don't want to give God a cause to destroy you. I, I have many times, but uh, good thing for me that God is a God of mercy. Verse 4, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath, he will give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Oh yeah, you can do anything you want, but you can't kill him. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet unto his crown. So he had, uh, I don't know if you know about boils, but they are very painful. But he had boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. And he, Job, took a pot shard to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Now, he rent his mantle, a mantle was a type of clothing that the prophets of God often wore. Uh, Elijah did, and Elisha, Elijah and Elisha, his student, 
and uh, he rent his mantle, and now he's sitting in ashes. He's probably in sackcloth and ashes. So, why didn't the Lord, the Lord let him, uh, Job, lose his sons and his daughters? But why didn't he take his wife? You know why? Because she's, she's uh, listen to this. All right, so, and he took a pot shard to scrape himself with owl, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Cursed God and die. Cursed God and die. That's why Satan didn't take his wife. She was working for him, it sounds like. Now, I'm not saying she was working for Satan, but, you know, <laughs> when you... When your wife tells you to curse God and die, oh boy. Verse 10, But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job, in all this did not Job sin with his lips. All right, so, Satan has power. He can strike you with illnesses, uh, the weather like tornadoes and bring fire down from the sky as long as the Lord allows him to do so. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Uh, we're, well, let's see. I did an entire playlist, an entire study, probably over 10 hours on the angels that sinned, it's on my home page. If you click on my name, uh, it'll take you to the home page. Then, it, you know, you look and it says playlist. Click on the playlist and you can see the angels that sinned. So, let's take a look at Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God... Now, Job 38 establishes that the sons of God are angels. We are not called sons of God in the Bible until the New Testament. Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God. Adam was called a Son of God. And angels are called sons of God because guess what? God was their father. And there are people that will tell you that the sons of God are righteous men. So take a look at this. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the, of, on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, Think Goliath, people. King David and Goliath, the Philistines that wanted to fight Israel. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. We're talking about the flood. There were giants before the flood and also after that, after the flood. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Things like Hercules. Uh, you know, he was the son of, I think, what, Zeus? When Zeus, the, the god of the Greek mythology, came down and married a woman, 
Uh, so Hercules was half God and half man. Uh, so, all right, so, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace. See, there's grace in the Old Testament, people. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Did you notice the first four letters in generations? It's G-E-N-E, -E, genes, DNA, people. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. He was perfect in his gene pool. And Noah walked with God. So, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. People, the fallen angels married the women, and they had giants for children. You know, look at every culture in the world that has a written history. There's a record of giants. Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, Paul Bunyan. Or, uh, yeah, Paul Bunyan. Uh, I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh the frost giants of, of northern Europe. Uh, you have legends galore. Uh, the Cyclops. You know, there there's, you know, I don't, uh, I don't like quoting the book of Enoch, but, uh, you know, you could read it, and it's quite possible that some of it's true. I don't know. So, but, the churches will tell you that the sons of God were godly men and the daughters of men were all wicked women. So what they want us to believe is that all the men were godly, the sons of God, and all the daughters of men were evil. So these godly men married these ungodly women, had children that were giants. And then God destroyed them in a flood. Now, that's what the modern church will tell you today. I mean, does that make any sense? All the men are righteous and all the women are evil and ungodly? You know, really? You know, and I've had people, they'll, they'll argue because why? They don't want you to know there's a race, a fallen, evil, wicked race upon this earth. And... When you go through this history, you will find that, now the Bible records genealogies quite a bit. I mean, you can trace Christ's genealogy all the way back to Adam. There are certain people in the Bible, they're, the Bible's very meticulous on genealogy. But you know what? Ham's genealogy and Canaan's just is silent. The Bible doesn't even record who Ham's, Ham was married to. You know, is it very possible that uh, Ham and or Canaan, Canaan was probably, you know, he was the father of the Canaanites. God did not speak very highly of the Canaanites. They had to be of the satanic seed line had to have. 
All right, let's take a quick look at the, the sons of Ham. Uh, Genesis 10 and verse 6. Now, God cursed Ham's son, Canaan. We don't know who Ham's wife was. Uh, you know, she might have been, she might have been of the satanic seed line. I don't know. I find it interesting that her name is missing. All right, so Genesis 10, 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. And the sons of Kut, Cush, Sheba, Havilah and Sabta and Ramah and Sabtikcha and the sons of Ramah, Sheba and Dedan. And Cush began, begat Nimrod. Now Nimrod uh, figures really prominently in legend with uh, the mystery religions, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, he was not a very good character as far as the Lord is concerned. So, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Ah, the Tower of Babel, people, remember? Not good. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Babylon was in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was where jo uh, Jonah went to. Uh, you know, the story of Jonah and the whale. And Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, they were the ones that took northern Israel into captivity before Babylon took Judah, southern Judah, into captivity. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Calah. And reason between Nineveh and Calah, the same is a great city. And Mizraim begat Ludlam and Ananim and Lehabim and Naphtuhim. I don't know. I'm not very good on pronunciation, sorry. And Parthrusim and Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim. Now, Philistim, that's where the Philistines came from. Uh, Goliath, the giant that uh, mocked David and Israel, he was a Philistine. So this is a not a good seed line. Uh, out of whom came Philistim and Kaphtorim. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite. How would you like to be called a Sinite? S-I-N-I-T-E. Sidon. Heth, Jebusites, the Amorites, the Hivites, not good. I mean, none of these, none of these people were in the Bible mentioned very nicely. Verse eighteen, and the Arvadite and the Gemarite and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou cometh to Gerah, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Canaanites are in Gaza, Gaza. I mean, you're talking the land of Israel, people. Uh, they were tied in with Sodom and Gomorrah. Doesn't sound very good, does it? And Adma and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries and in their nations. People, let me tell you something. These devil children went into the land to fight against Israel, God's people. That's why they were there. 
when Israel came out of the land of Egypt after their captivity there, and God put them in through the wilderness with Moses, they went into the land. What did they see there? Giants and the Canaanites. They were there to fight God's people. Bingo. War in heaven, war on the earth. And why did the sons of God, the angels, the fallen angels, want to marry the women? Well, maybe they wanted to destroy the genes, the DNA, the bloodlines, so that a Redeemer could not come. You know why there was a virgin birth, people? Why God chose Mary a virgin? Because when Adam fell, sin fell the curse of sin fell upon all men. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 5. We're going to prove a point here. Verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with through uh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. If you don't know what tribulation is, it's trouble, people. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because... The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Boy, that's, that's me. For scarcely, for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, there's people that will tell you that Paul is a false apostle and that his writings don't belong in the Bible. Sounds like the hiss of the devil to me. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Do you know what? You look at the word atonement. The first two letters, at, A-T. The next three letters, O-N-E, one. And then mint. We're at at one mint, or at one with God, through Jesus Christ. Atonement. Um, you know, if you stole something from somebody and then you felt bad about it and you returned it to them, you would be atoning for your actions. But we are at one meant with God through the blood of Jesus Christ and our faith in him, people. That's the gospel. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death 
by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You see, death passed upon all of Adam man's descendants because of the curse of sin. Read Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve would have lived forever, probably, you know, if they hadn't sinned. So, all right, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Now, celestial means heavenly. Uh, I believe this is talking about uh, angels. And terrestrial speaks of the earth. Have you ever heard of terrain? Well, they're talking about the earth. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth, differeth from another star in glory. You know, there is white stars, red stars, you know, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. See, some people are going to be resurrected unto uh, honor, and others are going to be resurrected unto dishonor. So, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Verse 45, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, which is Christ, okay, people? The last Adam was was made a quickening spirit. Okay? So, Christ is compared to the last Adam. He had the same mother and father, I guess you could say, in a way, as the first Adam. That's why I am of the opinion that Mary's DNA was not used, the virgin birth. You know, I believe that, I don't think Mary was, DNA was used. Because if her DNA was used and sin nature had passed upon all of mankind, she would have been corrupted with, well, Christ would have been tainted, right? That's why the virgin birth is so important. If you get a Bible that doesn't have the virgin birth, and the modern Bibles do away with this. They'll just say, oh, well, you know, young woman. Uh, throw it away. Throw it in the garbage. It's the devil's, you got the devil's Bible. The virgin birth is a very important doctrine, in my opinion. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that, was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As it is earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earth, earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. You know why Satan hates us so bad? 
When he looks at us, he looks at the image of God. Man was made in the image of God. That's why he hates mankind so much. We'll cover this again. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Ark fallen flesh, sin nature, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Can't do it. Verse 51. Behold, I will show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And sorry, it's not Donald. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When's the last trump? Well, there's seven trumps in the book of Revelation, and the seventh one is the last one, and is at the end of the tribulation period, not before. And I've had people tell me, well, you know, there's more than one last trump. And they said that this last trump is at the beginning of the tribulation. I'm like, what? You know, it's a shame uh, that, well, you know what? Uh, when I was in the army, we had a guy, uh, his name was like Abel or something, his last name, or Abelson or something like that. We had another guy, his last name was like Zawinski or something like that with a Z. And they always told us, line up in alphabetical order. And the Z guy was always last. You know what? If I tell you last, last means last. Sorry, the last trump is the seventh trump. There's not a, 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 a last trump before the first one. But that's what these idiots that preach the pre-trib rapture try to tell everybody. Ah, uh, you know, but God blinds their eyes. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All right, people, I think... We've covered enough. It's, you know, a little over an hour. I guess this is going to be part one. I'm just laid the foundation. We haven't even gotten started yet on the war in heaven, war in the earth. We're just getting going, people. Um, it's Chaplain Bob Walker, a little signing off. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and glory be to God the Father. In Jesus' name, amen.